The following feature presentation is part of the Skywalking Network. This is what you can look forward to on episode 475 of Skywalking Through Neverland. I'm going to start off by saying it's Star Wars without a Star War. I didn't really give it much thought. It wasn't until Celebration in Europe where we saw Amandla Stemberg come on stage in her Padme outfit. Oh, we were all sold. That's certainly one of the things that would be addressed in a season two, should we get one. There was a naked man yep. in Star Wars. Yep. <laughs> I want to say this also happened in the Darth Plagueis novel, where... Yeah! Do we think that they're going to get it on? <laughs> Are you ready? Welcome to Neverland! Here we go! A long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away... To all who come to this happy place, welcome. Disneyland is your land. When I first made Star Wars, everybody in Hollywood said, well, this is a movie Disney should have made. You're more than just fans. You're family. Best day ever! <laughs> Secrets love. It's about family, and that's what's so powerful about it. Hey, hey. When you use a bird to write with, it's called tweeting. When we visit the world of Disney, we never grow old. It's a Peter Pan never never land that keeps us young in heart. This is Jedi Master Obi-Wan Kenobi, and you are skywalking through Neverland. I have a good feeling about this. Hey, hey, Skywalkers! Seems like it's been just a few days since our last episode, but there's so much content just this week that we have to double up. So with that, we want to welcome you back to Skywalking, skywalking Through Neverland. Neverland. I am Richard Woloski, but now everyone please say hello to my sweetie wife, Sarah, the hardest working woman in podcasting. Aw, you know what? We get on kicks sometimes. Yeah. Either we're working really, really hard and like every moment doing, putting out content or doing something, or we're kicking back and relaxing and doing nothing because we need to like, we need to gear up. Oh, yeah, I need to decompress. Decompress. And then get right back into it. Yeah. But since the Wolverine and Deadpool press, press junkie, you've been putting out those reels and shorts. Yeah, it's so much fun. Oh, just seeing Hugh Jackman talk and Ryan Reynolds. Oh, my gosh. So Hugh Jackman and Ryan Reynolds, I'm going to put this out like after we talk here. But they they were asked, like, what's it like working with each other? And their comments about each other are so sweet. <laughs> you guys, I'm so excited to share. So I'll be sharing that on our YouTube very shortly. Yeah, she's, she's even working on a reel right now. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> All right. Well, Skywalkers, we are your enthusiastic podcast destination for the many decades of your Star Wars, Disney, Marvel, and pop culture fandom. So it's time for your weekly Wookiee hug <laughs> and your sprinkle of pixie dust from your family of Skywalkers. And we are live right now on the Skywalking Through Neverland YouTube channel. So if you haven't already, please subscribe for notifications. It really helps us out. Now in this episode, we speak with our good friend, Mike Celestino from the Who's the Boss podcast. And he joins us for a season series <laughs> finale of The Acolyte. We go, over, we go over our favorite moments, what we thought going in, and where we want a potential season two to go. It was an interesting conversation, might have changed some minds, and just hashing it out, talking about things really helps. You know, like you can have one thought about a show, but then you talk about it and you realize, oh, maybe I thought something different or it, it changes some opinions. So yeah, between the three of us, we had mm -hmm. differing opinions. So yeah. my opinion changed on one thing, or yours did, or Mike's did. Yeah. So it was a very evolving conversation. Very helpful, too. I always love that. Now, we are being sponsored by Small World Vacations, and they are a diamond-level Disney vacation planner travel agency and can help you book your trip to a Disney park around the world or on a cruise, the Disney Cruises. And best of all, this service is free, free of charge. So head over there to smallworldvacations.com for a no-obligation price quote and tell them Skywalking Through Neverland sent you. 
Now we are recording this episode from Long Beach, California, your second episode this week on July 22nd, 2024. So Richard, what happened today in Star Wars history? Well, we're going to start off by wishing our good friend, Star Wars origami author, Chris Alexander, Ah. on his 61st birthday. Wow. So July 22nd, was that 1963? 1963. Yep. Congratulations, Chris. Happy birthday. Now, for a San Diego Comic-Con tie-in, oh. it was on this date, July 22nd, 1976, 48 years ago, Lucasfilm head of marketing, Charles Lippincott, presents the panel, The Star Wars, a preview with Roy Thomas, Howard Chaikin, and Charles Lippincott at Comic-Con in down in San Diego. Wow. And Marvel comic writer Roy Thomas and Howard Chaikin, they follow the slideshow with a Q&A. And the Howard Chaikin poster, the Star Wars poster, sells for a $1.75. And now, at this point, I looked on eBay. Okay. The top one is selling for $6,195. Oh, my gosh. And it sold for $1.75 back then. That's crazy. Yeah. Also, how funny was it? That was probably the one and only Star Wars panel at San Diego (laughs) Comic-Con that year. And I've got a whole blog post about all the Star Wars content at San Diego Comic-Con this year. And let me tell you, that blog post is long. This was almost a year before it came out. Wow. Yeah, yeah, you're right. July to May. Yeah. Yeah. So does... Do any Skywalkers have this Howard Chaikin poster in their collection? was anybody, Skywalkers, were you there at that panel in 1976? Was our friend, uh, who goes to everything, um... Uh, Alan Sanborn? Alan Sanborn, was he there? That's a good question. He might have been there. Yeah, he's been to a lot of these early Star Wars events. We'll have Hmm. to ask him. Yeah. So there's some Star Wars and (laughs) Comic-Con history rolled into one. I love it. All right, well, now let's break down the Acolyte series or season finale with Mike Celestino. Attention, Skywalkers. Spoilers ahead. Warning. Warning. Attention, Skywalkers. Spoilers ahead. Warning. Warning. Spoilers ahead. Spoilers ahead. Another Star Wars series has just wrapped up. What were your favorite moments, surprises, and cameos. Mike Celestino from Who's the Boss podcast is here with us now, not only because he is a good friend of ours, but he is definitely more caught up on the High Republic than we are. Hey, 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 Mike. Mike. Hey, hey, Richard and Sarah. Thank you so much for having me back on the show so soon. I was here to talk about the beginning of the Acolyte. So it's only fitting that you're here toward the end of the season or series. We don't know. Yeah. Mm -mm. No, we don't. And it's kind of up in the air at this point. Yeah. I I think Leslie Headland did the right thing in ending it the way she did because it's like, well, there's so much story to tell, Disney Plus and Lucasfilm. (laughs) Why don't we just do another another (laughs) season? Come on. We we already set it up. Let's just take it home. (laughs) So many questions. She knew what she was doing. (laughs) Yes. Well, I thought I thought the same thing about the Willow series. They definitely ended that in a cliffhanger. That did yeah. not go as uh, planned. <laughs> no, that did not. That's a oh. whole different episode. There. R.I.P. <laughs> yeah, Willow. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, but you know what? Let's let's circle back to the acolyte. Now, there's there's so much to talk about, so let's just jump right in. So, Mike, give us your overall opinion of the whole season slash series. Okay, yeah. Well, I said on my last appearance on who's on. Sorry, I said on my last <laughs> appearance on Skywalking Through Neverland that I was withholding judgment until the end of the season because it, it is a mystery show, and I was going to judge it based on how well I thought everything wrapped up and whether I was satisfied with the results, with the answers that we were given. And I would say I'm about seventy percent there or so. Uh, I definitely understood what they were going for, and I think it worked most of the time. There were things that didn't work for me, however, but on the whole, I would say I enjoyed it. I liked it. I did not love it in the end. There were definitely things I loved about it. I thought the action was fantastic, 
very rarely do I say the action was my favorite part of something because I'm not an action oriented person. I mm-hmm. prefer drama and talking and inter inter character, you know, relationships and stuff. But this time around, I thought the action was absolutely the best part of this show. There were other cool moments I really enjoyed too, like some of the deeper cut Star Wars expanded universe legends timeline Easter eggs that we got to see brought to life in live action on this show. So I enjoyed it for those reasons. And the the actors were all really good. I just thought uh, it didn't quite add up to 100% the way that I wanted it to. Okay. okay. All right. Fair enough. Yeah. All right. Sarah. Uh, yeah. So I've been chatting about this online a little bit, like in some comment threads and things. And honestly, it was Joey Pittman who said it very succinctly in a comment thread I was in. Um, he said that there was some great big ideas here, like yeah. that kyber crystal changing, bleeding red. Yeah. Um, some of the this twin thing and the the virgins, you know, seeing a virgin on a planet rather than a place. But so there was great big ideas, but the execution was mediocre. And for me, that's how the series kind of is after we've seen the whole thing. Like to me, the music did not live up uh, to what I feel that Star Wars music needs to. And for me, that's like 50% of my enjoyment of something, especially Star Wars. So uh, like that was a big letdown for me. And even though it did get better in the last two episodes, I do have to say, uh, but so, so yeah, the, the execution was mediocre. There were times where there was these story hiccups and things like, May coming out of nowhere, like she was just fighting Osha, and all of a sudden she's showing up at this battle with Soul and well, that, Timer. That was the Force jump cut power in, in action. Oh, that's what that yes. was. Yeah, like just little things like that. That like the editing choices, like mm, I don't know about this. So to me, it that like the world building was good, and the ideas were great. It's just the execution of them took me out of the story. Okay. So what about you, Richard? I think time will be very good to the Acolyte. Mm -hmm. The same way time was very good to the Phantom Menace. Yeah. People just didn't, they weren't on board with that level of Star Wars at that point. And I don't think, though, the fandom was ready for the Acolyte at this point. So I think over time, when we see more in this time frame, the High Republic time frame... I think time will be very good to this because there were a lot, a lot of great ideas and a lot of forward thinking in the Acolyte. I really enjoyed it. I loved how how layered it was for better or for worse. And I say that because I wish they gave more of an idea up front that we'll be seeing different situations from a different point of view in the second half. We knew that it was eight Mm -hmm. episodes so we knew that this wasn't the whole story. Like for episode three, we went back in time 16 years to when May and Osha were little girls and Saul and the other Jedi came in and wreaked havoc, but we didn't really know what was going on. And a little piece of us were like, that didn't make any sense. Even though we knew it was going to continue, but it's like, oh, we, we've seen a lot of story hiccups looking at you, Obi-Wan Kenobi, we thought, (laughs) is this something that's going to be a story hiccup or is this on purpose? So for, because of that, it, it held me back from really, really going full force and, and loving it. And I wish they had maybe given us like at the very end, maybe a tag that jumped point of views. So we know, oh, that's coming up where we are going to see this. There's more to the story. Yes. Mm. So you wanted that to be more clear. Yes. That yes. you were seeing different points of view. Yes. And not the whole story. Okay. Yeah. I just give us a little, hey, just don't jump ahead. Don't go on social media and <laughs> blast this because the, there, there is going to be more to clarify the story. And I think this was so different that from, the, from what we've seen before. And I think that's what every franchise needs is something, hmm. a fresh new take on something. And this... This was a fresh take on Star Wars. Okay, nice. All right. Well, let's dial it back to what we were all expecting when we first heard about the series. So, who um, who's the Bosk Pod? I always called you. So, Bosk, Mike. Bosk. <laughs> what you got? I know your name, Mike. I just read the 
<laughs> read your little. And thing. I, I, I know we we, we kind of skim. We we all went over this a little bit when we first discussed yes. yeah. this, but now we have the full story. Right. Right. So with that in mind. I was thinking back to when this was first announced during that Disney Investor Day by Kathleen Kennedy as one of many projects that got announced there. And it it is one of the ones that got completed, thankfully, from the list that was revealed during that event. But uh, what I was expecting was, yeah, I, I knew that it had ties to the High Republic era or that it took place, I think they said, at the end of the High Republic era. So I knew there would be connections in some way to... The, pub- the publishing side of that storytelling initiative. And in fact, when I would bring this up, I've interviewed the High Republic authors a handful of times, and I would always bring up the Acolyte, and <laughs> they would become very hushed and uh, almost kind of reprimand me for asking about it because they would insist they're not involved with the show. They're not in the, the you know, Lucasfilm studio live action side they're involved with the publishing but it turned out that they were actually you know acting as consultants and that at least one of the characters that they created vernestra Rowe, was uh going to appear in the series so there was a connection there and i'm glad that that paid off so that part of what i was expe- <laughs> that part of what i was expecting came true as far as the rest of the show I- i'm always hesitant when something is so heavily focused on Jedi, because to me, they're kind of like Superman in the superhero comics world. Like they're almost invulnerable. They have a lot of very strong powers and they are very, you know, uh, morally superior as well as physically and mentally superior characters. So to me, they're not as interesting as somebody who's a little bit more flawed. And the fact that the show actually went in that direction and made the Jedi flawed, I found that to be a lot more interesting than what I was initially expecting, that we can explore the shortcomings of the Jedi Order rather rather than depicting it as this all, all-knowing, all all-good body of warrior monks going out and having adventures in the galaxy uh, I, I like that we got to see the darker side of the Jedi. And I know that people have been complaining about that. So uh, I don't know. I don't know why that would be a negative. To me, it's more interesting when the characters are are flawed. Wait, people are complaining about the Jedi not being as perfect as yes. they want Well, them? <laughs> I'm one of those a little bit. I, I'll, I'll give you my this other point of view. So for, for the Star Wars brand, the Jedi are have you know traditionally been good characters it's characters that you can look up to and it's character they are oh gosh what did trisha call it we we were talked about this on fangirls going rogue but they Almost like superhumans right well like not you, all humans but you know they're they're the people that can do no wrong well it's like you look up to them like it's character aspirational characters that's what it is the jedi are normally aspirational characters you can look up to them you want to be like them and it they provide a model of of what you should be you know something like that like for kids like yeah. it's a good oh, role model i suppose i see that but then again you look at the prequels and we see how easily corruptible they were, even though they didn't know they were being corrupted by, well, by Palpatine and Sidious. But right. they, they knew their place in the galaxy was to be guardians of the galaxy. And like, like Qui-Gon said, we're not warriors. Right. They are, they're, they're, they're almost symbols of peace. Mm-hmm. But then Palpatine said, oh, this is going to be fun. Let's get these symbols of peace and really turn them on their ear so that they become generals in this war that I created. And then you even see Qui-Gon. It's like, hey, he's got his own ideas of how Jedi should be and how they should act. And he wasn't totally on board. So right. I thought you started to see a lot of fracturing within the prequels. And then you see Count Dooku where he was one of the best Jedis and then all of a sudden splintered off because he didn't agree with what the Jedi upheld. But then you look at a character like Ahsoka who left the Jedi Order because she almost was sensing the fact that these Jedi were turning bad. and Not just sensing it, they they turned on her. Right. And so she became what she... She embodied all the things that a Jedi should do, like the actions of a Jedi. And so she is an aspirational character because of that. Well, That's what I yeah, mean by yeah. aspirational character, someone well, you like, can look up to. 
having Charlie Chaplin in 2024 run a movie studio? He's like, okay, all black and white and all going to be no sound. It's like, well, that worked well back right. then. But today we have sound, we have color, we have all kinds of things. So we're looking at two different ways of thinking. There's mm. the Jedi, when we first meet them in the, the Phantom Menace, they're still thinking of the High Republic days. Mm -hmm. Whereas Qui-Gon comes in and it's like, let's loosen up on this. Like, right. No, no, oh, no. Yeah. And then Count Dooku is like, well, I, I see what's happening with this and I don't so much agree with the Jedi and that's when the Palpatine saw that and said, "Hey, hey, hey! I can corrupt you." So I think since the since the prequels, we started to see a lot of fracturing. Now, we we learned that the fracturing began a hundred years before yeah. the Phantom Menace. And I think that be, that makes the Jedi so much more interesting than Mike. Mm -hmm. Like you, when I saw something was based on the Jedi, it's like, oh, all right, all right, clashing yeah. lightsabers for okay. <laughs> Four force powers. Okay, I get it. The, like those fan films sometimes. Yeah, that... like Superman, Superman. You know, yeah, every fan film was devoted to that. The ones that I've seen. I can't say every fan film was devoted to the Jedi being perfect. But, yeah, so when I first heard that this was going to be taking the point of view from the dark side, I thought, oh, we've never seen something like this. And because of this... I expected something much grittier, much much grittier, like a like an independent film of the '80s. That's what I really wanted to see. A lot of handheld camera work, nothing too polished. Huh? Like the the fight between Indara and May, perfect. I love that. But when I saw that, I thought, okay, we're not gonna get this gritty filmmaking style. Everything is oh. just almost too. It's too planned out, and I wish they had gone with more of George Lucas's style of filmmaking, where everything was more of a documentary, documentary mm. feeling for it. Mm. Like, the, like with Star Wars, if you notice, there's a lot of very long takes. Yes. Not just cut, 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 cut. That's very, that's very documentary style. I wish they had gone with more of that. So almost like we were seeing a documentary about the the end of the High Republic, the the coming in of this dark side, which we don't even know what this is. Is it Sith? Is it not Sith? We don't know. Okay. And I wish they had gone more on that style of, we don't know what we're watching, so let's just watch and see what, what comes through with this. Hmm. All right. Yeah, when, when I looked on this series, like even when that Investor's Day call happened, I didn't really give it much thought. It wasn't until Celebration in Europe where we saw Amandla Stenberg come on stage in her Padme outfit. Oh, we were all sold. And Jodie Turner-Smith just looking so regal. Like, those two really sold this series for me, and it really got me excited for the show, and I was excited to see those characters in the show. And so, you know, it started off with them, but um, I, I didn't really like where they took May and Osha, so, like, that kind of fell to, fell to the wayside for me, but I feel like... Overall, that's what I was expecting was just to see those characters and wanting to go with them. So that's where that's where they lie. All right. Well, you know, let's jump jump to casting then. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah, I didn't know who Amandla Stenberg was. I know they said she was in the Hunger Games and and this this and that. But when she came out in her Padme outfit, I thought, oh, we this is another Star Wars fandom ambassador. Yes. And I, I really liked what she had to to say in her her energy and the whole energy of the whole cast. I thought this this is going to be really fun to watch this. I was really concerned with Lee Young Jae or mm -hmm. JJ as they call him. Yeah. Since I didn't see much Star Wars potential from him in the Squid Game. Oh, really? Yeah, I thought he was good in that, but I thought okay, this is a one and done kind of an actor. But I was so wrong. I was so wrong. He was great. Mm -hmm. He was fantastic. And oh, <laughs> you have the Mike's got a is that a black series? Black series, Soul. Mr. Soul, yeah. Oh, <laughs> that's cool. Yeah. So I was so happy that I was wrong about my preconceived notion that he wasn't gonna fit in Star Wars. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I loved I loved JJ as well. <laughs> And Manny Jacinto really, really stood out for me, too. Yeah, he like was another character. one. It's like, wait a minute, this guy from The Good Place? Yeah. He's going to be a dark side character. Well, at that point, we didn't know yeah. that he was going to be a dark side. But is he Star Wars worthy? 
<laughs> oh boy. Yes, yes he, was. he was. Yeah. Yes, he was. What about you? Definitely the cast members that you have listed stood out to me. Loved Master Soul, loved Manny Jacinto's character, and let's see who else. The the witches I thought were really well cast and oh uh, yeah interesting characters. I would love to see more of them because you know we've seen Force witches in Star Wars before, but this was kind of a new sect that we hadn't met yet or explored before. And then I thought Rebecca Henderson did a good job as Vernestra, who is very different personality wise than we've seen in the book. So I think there's about 100 years separating the High Republic novels and the TV show. So I hope that should the books continue over the years, they get into how her character became a little bit more cynical by the time we get to see her in live action in The Acolyte. But yeah, I thought everybody did a did a pretty good job. I didn't really have any major complaints about the casting in the end. Yeah, I and again, Daphne Keene. Yeah, as great as JJ is, yeah. Daphne Keene for me was my favorite. Isn't yeah, my too? favorite casting choice. <laughs> what was her character's name again? She's Je- Jackie Lon. Jackie. So yes, Team Jackie. <laughs> Yay. But unfortunately, Spoiler alert. She got killed <laughs> off. Mm-hmm. I was so I was so upset. That whole episode I was yelling at the TV, not Jackie, not Jackie. What bam? Jackie died and uh-huh. I I like I like stood up and like yelled at the screen. <laughs> it's funny you see a lot of interviews now talking to you, Manny Jacinto saying when you were doing your press with Daphne Keene and Charlie Burnett. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Dude, how how hard was it to not say, oh, yeah, I, I killed them. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and Mandy said, I had to be so concentrated on everything that I said just so I didn't slip a little bit. Mm-hmm. And it was said that Daphne had slipped up and said that, oh, that Manny is a, he did all of his great stunts. And all of a sudden, people are like, oh, no, 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 no. But yeah. why, why is that a spoiler? Yeah. <laughs> That's not a spoiler at all. Yeah. But I think I, you, I, you expect most, even if they're not a Jedi or a Sith, you expect most Star Wars characters to at least get into some kind of action scene. So. Yeah, exactly. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. And as great as Daphne Keene was in Logan, I thought she was even better in this. Oh. Even from that one shot in the trailer, when all the Jedis are looking out into the woods, and she says, what is that? The way she delivered that line was so believable. So be- even yeah. I'm looking over my shoulder, going, "I don't know what was that." <laughs> <laughs> she was so so good. Yeah. All right. Now there's some really good things that happen in this series. Do we feel that anything was revolutionary in this series? And let's- I'm gonna start off by saying it's Star Wars without a Star War. <laughs> there's no. There's no really. Uh, st- Big intergalactic Star ah. Wars, and it's, it's very small and very concentrated. And we didn't see we didn't see a lot of big space battles until the very finale when Saul was chasing after May in, mm-hmm. in that ast- little mini asteroid field. Okay. That wasn't really a a Star War, so it was Star Wars without a Star War. Okay, all right. I'll go on to say that I really loved the fact that they had a bad guy being small and scrappy. You know, you're used to Darth Vader, very tall, very imposing. Mm -hmm. You're used to, well, the Emperor, but I guess, I don't know. Well, he's, he's, he's no, he's like, he's a Sith master. Yeah. But like, just to have, just to have Manny Jacinto like embody this stranger with the bare arms, even like that was a new thing. Usually everyone's all covered up as a Jedi. And I really, I really liked that, how he could kind of fade into the woodwork or come out and and freak you out, you know, like just, it's almost like a, like a Halloween type of bad guy, you know, or or, I mean, is it like a Batman? Like, am I Batman? Am I the stranger? (laughs) You decide. Yeah. Until we saw him without his sleeves on, he was very slender and and scrappy. Right. He took off his sleeves. Like, Oh, all of a sudden. Wow. He's cut. All all, all of a sudden (laughs) fandom switched. It's like, yeah, we like the show now. (laughs) We like this. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, like wow, eye candy there. And there's a whole another revolutionary new part of Star Wars. There was a naked man uh, in Star Wars. Yep. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> yeah, and even and I give him credit for May never doing the elevator eyes. <laughs> Her eyes just stayed locked on his. 
<laughs> and I'm sure there were some cut, some takes where they had to yell, cut, um, Amandla, look, look in his eyes. He's got <laughs> eyes, okay? Eyes up here. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, there's, there's so many different ways that this is revolutionary. Mike, wh- what, do you, what do you think about this? Definitely feels revolutionary for Star Wars in a lot of ways, but in the way it, it's similar to Star Wars of of period. Sorry, I'm still on very little sleep. Uh, my brain's catching up with me here. It feels revolutionary for Star Wars, but there are a lot of ways where it is similar to Star Wars of the past because it is borrowing from other genres and borrowing from literature borrowing from star wars in the literature side and the legends novels and the expanded universe so a lot of the stuff that did feel fresh and new already existed in the publishing side of star wars and then for as far as like genre goes and filmmaking goes leslie headland is borrowing from george lucas's uh, process of of lifting from existing media and, and storytelling in that way. So uh, I don't know if I would say it's it's revolutionary on a, a filmmaking level, but it does feel fresh and new for live action Star Wars. I would say that. Mm. Okay. Yeah, like the fact that in live action we saw this kyber crystal bleed. Yeah, oh, yeah. Like, that's something we've. Did we see it in animation? We in, like, the Clone we, Wars? we saw it in a video game. Okay. Okay. And the Jedi well, Jedi Survivor. Yeah. Jedi, Jedi That's Survivor, what it is. Yeah. And then of course we've heard like I've read about that. Yes. You know. Yeah. But now to actually see it in action. Right. That was that was really. I think cool. that was one of the moments we had, we had to pause and just collect ourselves for about twenty minutes. Mm-hmm. And it's really hard to make a lightsaber battle feel fresh and new. Very much. But so. they totally did that. I think with oh, very... that final battle between Soul and Keimer. Yeah, and I think that was so revolutionary because Keimer didn't he didn't play by the rules. Mm-mm. He was just slashing and and thrusting and and doing what doing so so unpredicted movements where Saul was like I, I don't know what you're going to be doing next because he played he didn't play by the rules and just the fact that he threw those two lightsabers <laughs> around you know and they were like coming around going to get Soul and Soul's like bam and then they threw <laughs> like it's just so symmetrical like yeah. nice I, I, I appreciate good symmetry on screen yeah you're right it's very hard to do a new lightsaber battle it's like oh, how are we going to top this and top yeah. this and top of this now we got to say that, of course, the biggest revolutionary moments in this were having a an African American woman be the lead. Ah, absolutely. That, that I I think Star Wars lost an opportunity to have Vi Marathi lead a, an animated show or even mm. a live action show. Yeah. Why they didn't make Galaxy's Edge into a series, I don't. I've got no idea. Mm. But like we said the last time we did a breakdown, I. It didn't really dawn on me until after we saw the fourth episode of our screeners. Like, hey, this this was all led by a a black female, mm-hmm. but they did such a great job in the storytelling that it was they didn't shove it in your face. No. And then they had the, the same sex marriage of the witches. Yes, Mother which, Anasea and Mother Coral. Yes, and I don't think they threw that in your face. No, that was it just was, a fact. It was a, a background piece of information while the story unfolded. So I think right then and there, I know a lot. A lot of fandom just tore their hair out because of this, but but it, you can call it woke, but that means that they're addressing a situation. That's not always a bad thing unless they take it to the nth degree and make seven dwarves into seven magical creatures. That's taking it to the nth degree, but I don't think they did that at all, and I didn't understand why people got so freaked out by those two elements. Mm. Now, we can't uh, we give an, an honorable mention to Kalnaka and his shaved Wookiee head. <laughs> <laughs> we've never seen that something new. <laughs> yeah, I don't think we've seen a shaved Wookiee head. No. And, and then he also had like the, the symbol on it, like the the witch's symbols. Yeah. That was like the yin-yang kind of a symbol. <laughs> Next time I, got, I get a haircut, I'm going to bring in that picture and say, make <laughs> me look like Kalnaka. <laughs> Even in the uh, Shadows of the Empire... They tempted to up, up, update Chewbacca by giving him a flat top. Oh, right. that's right. <laughs> it's like, yeah, you look more like kid and play than Chewbacca now. <laughs> I think Kelnaka's fight scene when he was possessed by the witches and fighting against Sol and Torben, I think that might have been my favorite scene in the whole 
series. That was so awesome. That scared me. <laughs> oh, yeah. To see a Wookiee with his reach, like, just coming down on you. Pause. How do you, how do you, like, how do you even deal with that? And even his revealing shot where he was almost silhouetted against that sky. Yeah. The two moons. Yeah. Oh, yeah. In back of him. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> good stuff. And I think if, if you know the, uh, the background of Wookiee culture where they're basically forbidden from fighting with their claws. Right. Uh, and if they use them in battle, they become outcasts to society. Uh, that gives that whole scene more more weight to it. Well, now, where is that from? I I don't remember ever reading that. I think it's it's the Wookiee's enemies who are writing this down. Like, yeah, Wookiees, <laughs> I'm sorry. You cannot use your powerful bear paws to, to rip our arms apart. I want to say I got it from Knights of the Old Republic, maybe, the video oh. game. But okay. uh, yeah, it's out. It's out there somewhere in the Star Wars lore. Yeah, let's That's just go funny. ahead and erase that from the Star Wars canon. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Wow. So, Mike, what questions do you still have uh, after seeing the finale? Oh yeah, what happened between Chimere and Vernestra to cause the rift there between Master and Apprentice? And I think. That's certainly one of the things that would be addressed in a season two, should we get one. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Yeah. They just tease that at the end. I have a big question about this f- the finale um, that I hope you guys can help me answer. So at the beginning. That's why Mike's here. Yes. Well, <laughs> both of you, both of you, I want your opinions because I was so confused. So what happened when Osha, she put on that helmet, right? The helmet. The that's Stranger's to, helmet. The Stranger's helmet. And when she put it on at the very beginning of this finale like Keimer's eyes went black and then she came out of the helmet and her eyes were red I was so confused as to what was happening there so do you guys have any well we saw that same thing happen with Inside. Torben and his eyes went black right and I think she was trying to enter his mind and since she was very untrained it just didn't stick Okay. I, this is just my hypothesis. Yeah. I, I have looked to see what the meaning behind that was, and there so far has not been uh, a solid answer okay. to that. But to me, to me, what I got from it is that she was trying to enter his mind. I think be, even unknowingly, this is what was happening. Yeah. And he was fighting right. it because he, he's very much trained in this. Okay. So... And it just it just didn't stick until boom, he went back and forth, back and forth, and boom, and then he took the helmet off her. Okay. What yeah, I was Mike? I was confused about that as well. First time I saw it, I've seen the episode I think three times now, and my interpretation as a, as I've settled on what I think is going on there is that kind of like what what Richard was saying, un, maybe unintentionally, because she is in that uh, sensory deprivation helmet. Her her witch you know her innate witch powers are oh. taking control, maybe beyond her own control. She's unleashing these powers and uh, preventing Chimer from getting in there and helping her take the helmet off. Like the the powers are almost taking control of her body her, oh. without her without her. Yeah, I think it's uh, very like the, unintentional. Like the, like the one intention. ring. Yeah. Like the one yes, ring. When exactly you touch like the, the one, one ring, ring. Yes. and it starts to mess with your head. Exactly okay. like the one ring, yes. Uh, now Richard doesn't understand that because that's a Lord is that, of the is Rings that a sports reference. Thing? <laughs> no. But okay, so that that makes more sense to me. So it was almost like she is more dark side focused than even she knew. Oh, very by much. putting on that sensory deprivation, it kind of unlocked that power within her and she went straight to the dark well, side. Well, I think it unlocked the truth. Right, right. Okay, okay, that makes sense. See, I was confused because I thought it was sensory deprivation, which means she couldn't affect anything outside of her. But I guess that wouldn't make sense because um, there was already a lightsaber battle where Keimer was wearing the helmet and still using the force on people. This is a new aspect of cortosis, I think, because previously it had only ever deflected the lightsabers. But it's based on what Keimer said... I think that the helmet does prevent other Jedi from reading yes. his mind. Yes. Yes. Or, de- yes. or detecting his presence. Yeah, detect- right. In that last episode, we see when Vernestra lands on Brendock. Yes. She she can immediately sense that he's there. And then he puts on the helmet to like kind of stop her right. from going into his mind. 
Right. Yeah. But yeah. the damage was done. She's like, you're alive, she says. Yeah. Yes. But I do think you can still use the force when you're wearing the helmet. Yes. Oh, yes. Okay. I think the I think the M count, or I'm going to say it, the midi chlorines then yeah. take over to ah, what you're feeling. Right. Yeah. And they... So you're connected. You're so well connected to those midichlorians that you don't even need to see. Like you can put the blast shield down, okay. and you can still fight. That was speaking of which, I love that shot. It was very quick when Saul went to go headbang uh, Chimera with the lightsaber, and yeah. Chimera did a headbutt to the lightsaber, <laughs> and, and it bounced off. Oh, that was <laughs> that was a great shot. It was very very quick, but I love that. Okay. And when, when Osha puts the helmet on and you hear the Vader breathing. Uh. Oh, I, I love that connection so much. But at the same time, I thought, Ugh, it's so good that fans are going to hate it. <laughs> I really, I but I really appreciated that. Okay. Now, Any other questions? I got a question yes. about one of the great cameos, Plagueis. Plagueis. Oh. Now... Leslie Headland has confirmed that is Darth Plagueis. Now, was he conspiring with Chimera or just watching from the shadows? Oh. That could go either way. Well, yeah, so he can either just be, like, secretively watching Chimera or Chimera can actually be his Apprentice. acolyte. Right. Or acolyte, sure. Acolyte looking for another acolyte because that's what, that's what the Rule of Two does, you know. Right, but he wouldn't allow his apprentice to take on well, his no, own acolyte. That's happened several times. But unaware of the master's awareness. Uh, I mean, Dooku kind of took on, you know, Ventress, Pat- Ventress and things. Yes, but and, then, then and the emperor knew about it. Then the it. emperor said, "Hey, you know what? You gotta, you gotta nix her." Right. I think I want to say this also happened in the Darth Plagueis novel, where yeah. Palpatine starts to take on Maul as his apprentice, right? While he's still being, while he's mm-hmm. still training under Plagueis. Yeah. And that causes the whole, you know, because there can only be two. Yes. So somebody has to go. <laughs> Vader does that with Luke. You know, yeah, you join yeah, yeah. me and together we can rule the galaxy yeah. together. And the implication is throw off the, overthrow the Emperor. Right. Yeah. And we be the rule of two. Right. But I'm just wondering if still, if Plagueis... Were, was was conspiring with Chimera on another planet. And this planet is this secret planet that Chimera is taking his secret apprentice to, unaware, uh, hopefully unaware, hopefully Plagueis is unaware of this. So by the time his apprentice, Acolyte, has been trained, they can go back and, and kill Plagueis. But Plagueis, I think he's on to them yeah. and was hiding wow. in those caves. We know where that story goes. <laughs> Right. If, so, if so I don't. I don't. Legends. I think. I think that's. I boiled boiled my answer down to that. That oh. Chimera was taking on an, an acolyte, thinking Plagueis doesn't know about this because this is an unnamed planet. And yeah, he knows. Yes. And okay. Chimera. I mean, and Plagueis has been following them. That's why he kind of did the whole. Eh, okay, I see. <laughs> kind of did the chin <laughs> rubbing. Like, mm, right. All right. We're gonna have a conversation later on, Chimera, that you're not going to enjoy. I also saw, you probably saw this as well, Leslie Headland said that the reveal of Darth Plagueis was supposed to be the final yes. moment in the episode, and then they moved it earlier because she wanted to end on, I guess, the characters that we had been following. Yeah. Uh, uh, so and that I, very yeah. iconic Star Wars shot where right. they're looking out right. into the future that is to become. Yeah, but I, I do think the implication is that, yeah, he's been, he is onto them onto the new apprentice being taken under Chimere's wing uh, outside of his influence. Right. And I also think that if he hears about this vergence, he's going to be very yeah. interested in <laughs> Brendock. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, that's, and, that's and, the ta- and taking yeah. And taking Chimere's acolyte. It's like, wait oh, a yeah. minute, uh, Chimere, I was interested in you until I heard about this girl who is a virgence? Well, who was formed from a virgin. Right. Yeah, yeah, Correct. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. 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 But yeah. So I think Chimera is it's in his best interest to hide her right. from him until she is ready. Yeah. Because yeah, have, just this whole virgins thing alone will make any Sith Lord going, okay, I'm listening. Okay. And once again, this unnamed planet. What? Why is it an unnamed planet? 
<laughs> Lucasfilm Story Group, you got a name for the planet? We gotta go. We gotta shoot this right now. It's like I, I don't know. Just okay, call we're, it now, the we're editing. Planet. now we're editing. Yeah. What, what are we gonna put? Okay, what are we, we put in the titles, yeah. the captions. Yeah. <laughs> we need some text here. What are we gonna put down there? Just call it unnamed planet because we don't know. <laughs> we don't want to tick anyone else off. Can you call it Oct two two, Oct Oct three. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I have a question. I have a question branching off from that final shot we see of Kymer and Osha looking off into the distance. Do we think that they're going to get it on? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, that's another kind of behind the scenes thing that has come out. They they originally kissed in that oh. final scene and they cut that out. <laughs> <laughs> oh well honestly yeah. I, I like that there's a question there although yeah. there's no question in my mind i'm shipping them well the, <laughs> well they're not holding hands they're no. holding light the lightsaber right saber. but the lightsaber is bringing them together like yes. that's the dark side saber that she bled red and uh the dark side's holding them together and it can only end in tragedy but damn it do i want to <laughs> see them get it on <laughs> i am not ashamed to admit <laughs> well you know mc is doing an r-rated film hey, yes with it is Deadpool and wolverine uh-huh. maybe maybe if Acolyte 2 were to come out as an <laughs> R-rated season? There you go. <laughs> there you go. Would would that actually happen no, though? I n- it wouldn't. No, not whatsoever. But that would be very interesting. I don't know. I don't know if something like that would make fans happy or even more upset. <laughs> I, I I can't I can no longer predict Star Wars fandom. <laughs> Yeah, well, I think Deadpool's a special case because that has always been R-rated. Exactly, he has yes. always been R-rated. Yes, he has always yes. been uh, on that line, across that, crossing that sex line. Oh, yeah, line, he like... is like one slur away from an X rating. Yes, <laughs> yes. And so, yeah. In fact, in the press conference we just did, Ryan uh, Reynolds said that it's the most wholesome R-rated movie because <laughs> nothing is there for just for R-rated sake. It all has a meaning to the Deadpool character. Which, okay. And Wolverine character, obviously. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I get anyway. it. Okay. But so I don't think that Star Wars has that kind of built-in r rated No, it does not. But right. that's the only thing I can predict about Star Wars fandom. They will get upset. <laughs> In a good way or a bad way. That's true. I don't know. It's what know. you do with when you're upset that counts. <laughs> do you go and do you slur things and do you... Make or do you go, hey, you know what? Or do you go, hey, everyone has an opinion. Let's or, you know talk about why we don't like this or like it. Or if I don't like it, guess what? There's a million other options on Disney Plus I can watch instead. Yes. And I can have a very, very peaceful day. Yeah. That's not the kind of filter they have. <laughs> but suddenly we're we're taking a tangent <laughs> yes, on yes. the dark side of fandom. All right, I wanted to a- point out, oh, sorry, really, really quickly going back to the planet. I don't know if you guys have stumbled across this, but people have kind of figured out what planet this is from the Legends timeline. Oh. Oh. Uh, It's called Baldemnik. And this is because of the cortosis veins that are running up. Ah. You know, when Osha sees the cortosis, it's actually coming from the inside of the cave there. But there is this planet. It actually appears in the Star Wars Darth Plagueis novel. Okay. Uh, and it and it involves the the story of this planet involves Plagueis, so it makes sense that he would show up there. Now that they've brought it over to the main canon, uh, I, it hasn't been confirmed by Lucasfilm whether they are going to still call it by that name. But it seems it certainly seems like from the description of the geography as well in the novel that this is a very similar planet to what we saw in that book. Okay. Yeah, I, I, we need to read that book again. When did we read it? Like 2006? Yeah. It was a while ago. It came out? Yeah. 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 And it was so, I remember like being blown away by it. It was so good. Yeah. But yeah, my memory fades in that kind of, you know, those yeah. details. Yeah, sure. Yeah. It's been 20 years almost. Yeah. All right. Now, I know we kind of touched upon it here and there, but if there's one one other thing you want to see in season two, oh. what would it be? I know we, we talked about an R-rated season or shipping characters. <laughs> But Mike, if there was one thing, if Leslie called you and said, hey, Mike, we need, we need one idea from you. What is it? Okay. Well, there's another character who's not a Jedi or a Sith who is long lived and shows up in the Star Wars sequel trilogy and is in the High Republic as well, which means she is alive during the period of the Acolyte. And I would love to see her pop up again and serve some kind of <gasps> oh! role. And her name is Maz Kanata. Yeah. I think she would be great in The Acolyte. Yeah. Like if they went, if she still, if she had her, uh, what is it, bar still? Her you castle, know? yeah. Her castle, her castle yeah. on Taco Donna. 
Right. Yep. Wow, that that would be really cool. Mm-hmm. I already mentioned that I just want to see Keimer and Osha have this like tragic love story. <laughs> I'm all about the love stories in Star Wars. That's how I got into Star Wars through Han and Leia. Okay. And to see like a tragic dark side version of that, love it. All right. If they were to do another eight episodes in that last episode, I'd want to see the birth of Palpatine. Hmm. Mm. That would be that would be uh, a, a check off of my list of things I want to see. <laughs> and what I don't want to see is a whole lot of Yoda. <laughs> yeah, just the back of his head silhouette, just the, the perfect. Just leave it at that. That was perfect. Leave it at that. I love Yoda, but we don't want to overuse Yoda. Right. If we do get to see the birth of Palpatine, though, I hope we get an exploration of why his parents named him Sheev. <laughs> you know, he, he was born in prison, and you know what? Hey, who's 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 got the, the next Shiv? It's Shiv. Is it Shiv or Shiv? I don't know. What do we name our kid? Sh- Shiv? No, let's, let's name let's name him Shiv. All comes from that dark place. Isn't it spelled like Shiv though? S H E E V. Oh, it is E E V. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. I thought it was just a long I. <laughs> no. All right, now, speaking of Yoda, when, yes. when Leslie Headland go, went on and on and on about <laughs> not seeing Yoda in this <laughs> in this series, did you believe her, Mike? In a word, no. <laughs> because I think it was on your show that I predicted that Yoda would show up in the final episode of yeah, The you Acolyte. Did. Okay, so uh, uh, chalk one up for me on that. On that. So, <laughs> yeah, I had no idea whether he would actually come come into the into play or not and yeah there he was people have said that the puppet because it does look like it's a puppet but people have said that it looks like it might have been the puppet that was created for the last jedi specifically that puppet of yoda it looks very similar to that puppet how do people like sus- <laughs> how how do people suss that out uh, yeah, I think I, just paying really close attention. <laughs> I think just saying it, it's like, hey, yeah, that was the uh, the Yoda from from Last Jedi. Okay, I guess. And we, I, I loved how was how Yoda's ears went yeah. up. Like he yes. knew, he knew what was going down. Yeah, that was cool. Yeah. Now I'm more of a believer, even though Star <laughs> Wars directors and actors have lied continuously about what's to happen, and and rightfully so. When she said we're not going to see Yoda, I thought, oh, that's too bad. Really? Yeah, I, I I I tend to believe people. Okay. All right. What, what about you? Did, oh no, I thought I thought you would see him. <laughs> okay. I think probably cuz Mike said that one thing in our discussion. I was like, "You know, that would be cool." So that just imprinted in my head. I liked it. Okay. All right. <sighs> now, let's let's talk about something that that you noticed, Sarah, and that Mike and I we have said repeatedly yeah. that we just don't hear the music that you hear. <laughs> yes, the music. I mean, really, it's that music that surrounds Star Wars. We just did that rewatch of like the Book of Boba Fett, all the Mandalorian, all those shows. And, you know, watching that, the music really stands out. You have you have the music at the beginning in every main title card. You have it at the end. You have it di- like basically announcing defining moments for characters in these shows. And I feel like, you know, Michael Abels did a good job, but I don't think he really imprinted on what Star Wars music is, which is you have the, those light motifs that depict certain characters. They depict certain situations like the light side, the force, you know, things like that. And they they have these it's just something with the music of Star Wars like it taps into that mythic quality of what Star Wars is and i feel like we didn't get that with the acolyte okay it, it we got more of situational mood music in most of it now i do feel like like i said you know we went over how in the fourth episode the music was really good and now the final episode here I do want to bring up a few things that was done really well. I feel like the music when Keimer and Soul lightsaber fighting, one of the reasons that lightsaber fight was so awesome, because the music, the soundtrack sounded really cool. It was very Star Wars Visions, so it brought kind of like a Japanese flavor to it, which I appreciated. And then when Soul went and visited 
the scene of the crime of his crime of uh, killing what's her name mother Anasea. Anasea. mother Anasea. yes um you know you hear those female witch vocals that you heard 16 years ago um like kind of echo mm -hmm. in his mind and i thought that was really well done but like the parts where i don't think it was well used and where it could have really used some kind of mythic quality to the music was like like this whole series is about these twins that aren't twins right they're twins that are born from one person and they're separated and you feel like by the end of the series, they're going to like come together somehow. So when there's that scene, when they came together and they said they're sorry for each other and they hugged right before they separated again, I feel like the music there should have been almost like the, the throne room at return of the Jedi. Like, 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 like where the was voices, those, like the, the vocal, like a chorus, the chorus right. a chorus going on, like really like, hitting home to you like this is a big moment in this character journey here okay now i would say that's something that's i would put in the revolutionary okay section oh. that they did something very different with the music okay and i i appreciate the fact that michael abels is is a renowned composer yes he is so he knows he, he knows what he's doing and leslie headland knows what she's doing so i think this was something that was very intentional. Like we've in past Star Wars, we've heard this, all these soundtracks, all this music underscoring. Let's let's hold back on that. Let's just pull back a little bit, and then wait until the end of the season, so the music can start building and building and building. So I would say that's that's something that they've tried to do. Okay. And to me, I, I thought it it worked really well, but I know with you, it's like nails on a chalkboard, not hearing music. Well, maybe I need to open up my mind a little more then, but you know, like maybe I'm the stick in the mud, you know, Star Wars fan now going, get off my lawn, make that music right. You <laughs> well, know, they, they so. should have called this the acolyte. <laughs> we're trying things new. <laughs> yeah. So I, you know, and we're going to hear, I'm going to hear Michael Abel's at Comic-Con. Mm -hmm. So I'll be very oh, interested. Oh, I hope there's no Q and A. Uh, I know. Well, <laughs> Yeah, what am I going to say? <laughs> Michael Abels, why didn't you? Blah, 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 blah. Yeah, no. Uh, but yeah, so I am I'm I still have an open mind about it. I want to see what he says. And Star Wars itself has shared some interviews with Michael Abels, like on um, socials and stuff. Right. But now, what do you think about this whole Kylo Ren theme? That is that where... At one night, Mike, <laughs> Mike, you texted, did we just hear Kylo Ren's theme? <laughs> yeah, and I was like, what? Yeah, we heard it like five times or so yeah. within this series. I am really not sure. I'm unclear how it ties in. No, and I saw, again, an interview with Leslie Headland, probably halfway through the series where she said, oh, you're going to know by the end. And I feel like I still don't know. But I, I kind of posed that question on threads and other people replied and said, oh, it's the, the journey of Chimer and Osha and May is reminis thematically reminiscent of what Kylo Ren goes through, but I don't know if that's enough to no, no, is it not, not whatsoever. <laughs> no, because that was specifically Kylo Ren's right. theme. Yeah, like what, like his journey to the dark side. Is that what? No, like, that's that's co confusing. Okay, no, that's mm. that's that's pointless. If anything, well, maybe right. maybe Chimera is going to be one of the founders of the Knights of Ren. Yeah, that's the other theory that I've seen. But then we wouldn't know that un unless the series continues. <laughs> right, right. Hmm. Yeah, they some sometimes answers are good. Right, and just telling us what exactly it's there for. And I know some people have asked Leslie Headland other things, and she's like. I don't know. We just did it, and we wanted to see what happened. Which yeah. I I respect if you're gonna go out there and say that, but don't don't do the the thing that Dave Filoni will say. Well, you know what? Uh, you'll find out in six years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Moving on with that because yes. I can see Sarah's face is like turning Hulk red. No, no, well, no. I just I feel like I haven't watched it enough to form okay. a deeper opinion about it than I have right now. Okay. If that makes sense. Yeah, next On time. The music specifically? Yeah. yeah. When we do a rewatch, just think of it as a, they're trying something yeah. new, a new kind of format where we build with the music. And we should mm -hmm. say, as of, I think it's yesterday when this came out, the, the final four episodes are now available to stream the score on oh, perfect. Spotify. 
Oh, good. Okay, excellent. Yeah, maybe there we can find yeah. some more answers. Or do you know where we can find some more answers? Where? On season two of the Young Jedi Adventures, which is coming out next month. Wait, what? Yes, maybe we'll find some answers there. <laughs> Mike, what do you think? Well, I will say that I've read I've read and consumed like 95% of the High Republic and the Young Jedi Adventures series is sadly one of my gaps. I've seen I think 8 or 9 episodes out of the 30 I think that have been released. That's so, about where we are too. Yeah, uh I am not the expert on that show. It is targeted at a much younger <laughs> demographic than most Star Wars stuff. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think we're going to get answers for the Acolyte. Totally different audience than the Young Jedi Adventures, well, which is the three to five year old. Wouldn't that be awesome <laughs> if they did put some answers and like, hey, you got to watch everything to get all the answers. Yeah. Right. Like having to re read these one shots comics to find out why 3PO has got a red arm. <laughs> Yes. You may not have noticed me because of my red arm. <laughs> yeah, but I I would lose it in a good way if they suddenly put something in there about Plagueis or anything. Well, yeah. or, oh. or add no, nubs no. to the season two of Acolyte. Oh, my God. <laughs> now, Mike, I, I don't know about this. Do you know how far before the Phantom Menace, the Young Jedi Adventures, takes place? Yes. So the Acolyte is about 70 years before the Phantom Menace and the High Republic phase one, which is when the Young Jedi Adventures takes place is a hundred years before the Acolyte. So it's total 170 years. Wow. Okay. So maybe we won't see nubs. There we go. Well, we don't know okay. how long a nubs <laughs> lives uh, for. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Well, where do we, where do we rank this particular series in with the other live action series of Star Wars that have come out? I'm going, Opinion? and I, I formed this kind of a question in how, when would I rewatch the series or oh. would I be excited about rewatching it? Okay. Like we just rewatched Mandalorian, had a great time with it. Book, Book of, of Boba, Boba Fett, Fett, another great one. Another great series. Uh, this had so much I'm going to say it again, revolutionary aspects to it that I'd be excited to watch this again and can really appreciate what they had done. So I'm going to put this number three ahead of Ahsoka and oh. Obi-Wan. Okay. So I'm going to say this is right, for me, right below Mandalorian and Book of Boba Fett and now The Acolyte. Okay. I think thought it was about in the it fell about in the middle for me of all the live action series so far i think i liked it more than obi-wan which was my least favorite book of boba fett is probably just a bit over obi-wan and then probably acolyte uh as my third least favorite if that makes sense but i've liked all of them uh and i really I would probably judge it based on whether or not i would buy it if it mm. came out on 4k disc and i bought obi-wan on 4k disc so I guess I'm going to buy Acolyte, too, if and when that comes out. <laughs> All right, oh, we're but, also but now, Andor. Andor, yes. Yeah, I forgot about Andor, and, too. And Andor is my second favorite, I think, of the series, with Mandalorian being the first. Okay. I'm almost embarrassed because Andor just felt such a... It's such it's a different so different, feel? even yeah. a, a different feel than the Acolyte. And yet it's my top. Yeah. I, my top. Okay, I'm going to say... <laughs> ironically, so Andor is my... is I would say my second favorite. So, book of, I'm um, sorry, The Mandalorian, Andor, Boba Fett, and The Acolyte. And then you need Ahsoka in there, yeah, too. Yeah, Ahsoka, yeah. which I really liked, but I think I like the, I think The Acolyte edges it out just a little bit there. And Obi-Wan, that was, this was the one I was most excited about, but it had way too many story hiccups. When we just rewatched it, it's like, oh. They yeah. really stood out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Ahsoka to me, was a little bit more consistent in quality than the Acolyte. Yeah. Acolyte probably had higher highs and lower lows, but Ahsoka ha was more even across the field. So I did give it points for that, probably. Okay. That makes sense. Okay. Yeah, I'd say for the fulfillment of things I was looking for in the Acolyte and the music, it's my bottom. That doesn't mean I didn't like it. But, you know, I had some more issues with it than the other series. Mm. Um, okay. So Acolyte would be bottom, then... Obi Hello, Obi-Wan? 
Yeah. Then Obi Wan, and that because I like the characters. You know, seeing Obi Wan, see little Leia, like that yes. was just a freaking awesome thing. Like I but, love the fact that little Leia's in there. She alone like saves that series because it's little Leia that I he's think working with. That was the biggest surprise of all yeah. the Star Wars series. Yeah, is having little Leia be the star of Obi Wan, and Kenobi. then getting to see Alderaan. Like oh. her, like that oh. has been a thing I've been wanted to see. So that that alone, I I liked that. Um, and then you know the other series, I guess it would go like what Ahsoka, and then well, Book of Boba Fett, Ahsoka, pretty much on the same level. Then Mando, then Andor is the top for me. Okay, yeah, because Andor just just on every level, every storytelling level, that that series just was a banger. And whenever we banger. Whenever yeah. we watch Andor, we, at the end, we always get so upset that we got to wait so long for season two. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Well, Mike, once again, thanks for coming on and sharing your thoughts about the Acolyte and giving us the background we didn't have on the High Republic. Mm -hmm. Now, when the Skywalkers, I know they already know this, but when they want to when they want to reach out to you on social media or hear your podcast, where do they go? What do they do? My podcast is called Who's the Bosk, B-O-S-S-K, and I do that for LaughingPlace.com, which is a Disney-focused entertainment news website. You can find me on Instagram at Who's the Bosk Pod. Excellent. All right, Mike. Well, we'll be seeing you. So take us out High Republic style this time. For light and life. I remembered it this time. <laughs> <laughs> They didn't, awesome. they didn't say it at all. In the no, there was a moment they were going like I, I said, oh, take us. When, when was that moment in, in the Acolyte? The finale, there was a when, scene. When the senator says, may the force be with you. Yes. Oh. Yeah. Oh. I was like, oh, for light. And, and he's like, may the force be with you. I was like, oh, OK. <laughs> That wraps up episode 475 of Skywalking Sky Through Neverland. Neverland. We want to thank Mike Celestino for joining us once again on the show. And thank you to all of you Skywalkers who listen every week and tune in. And please subscribe on our YouTube channel, Skywalking Through Neverland. Now, do you have things that you want to share? Well, join us because we do. We got lots of things to share every single week. So join us Mondays at 6 p.m. Pacific time on our live YouTube shows where we'll share things that we've done this past week, maybe some relevant news, convention appearances, maybe play some games. Yeah. You never know. And we invite you Skywalkers to come on and share what you've done. If you have a national Kiss a Wookiee week or a day or a month. <laughs> yeah. Come on and share that. Share something you've added to your collection. We want to hear from you, the Skywalkers. Are you interested in our books? We autograph copies. Autograph copies of Today in Star Wars History, Parts 1 and 2, and Skywalking Through My Phantom, your interactive notebook, are available now from skywalkingthroughneverland.com slash book. That's one way to support us, and you can also support us through the Skywalking Force, which is our Patreon. We were able, this year, we had access to 12 free four-day badges to San Diego Comic-Con, and we offered them to the Skywalking Force, and they were all taken up. So thank you, Skywalkers, for supporting us, and we do anything we can for you. So when we have those free little fun things or you know, things we can invite you to, we definitely think of you first. You help us, and we want to help you. So you can check that out at skywalkingforce.com. Now, we want to thank our sponsor once again, Small World Vacations, for their continued support. Thinking of a trip to a Disney park or a Disney cruise? Well, you can fill out a get a quote form at smallworldvacations.com today. Their vacation planning service is free of charge. And as always, don't forget to tell them you were sent by Skywalking, Skywalking Through Neverland. Neverland. We are part of the Skywalking Network. Skynet. Where you can find other great shows like Talking Apes. The Max FX Podcast. The Neverland Clubhouse. Totally Tell Me Everything. Star Wars Ologies. And the YouTube shows Collectopolis and Today, Today in Star Wars, Wars History. History. Also, Jeff, thanks again. Yeah, he was one of our Skywalkers. Thank you, Jeff. Well, glad that you're going to be there. Yes.
All right, you can find us on socials. We are at Skywalking Pod, and you can search Facebook and YouTube for Skywalking Through Neverland. Now, don't forget to stick around for bloopers and other fun bits that didn't make it into the show. And always remember... To love and support the Acolyte. And... Neverland Never on, on Alderaan. And I'm going to need you to do your clappy claps. Anyway, but we did our makeup today. So here you can see close up. It's fun. I got purple on the top and there's some teal on the bottom. And then we have bright red lipstick because if you think 80s, it's all about that. Julie, Julie remembered. <laughs> Julie remembered. I didn't. I skipped over that in the notes. All right, that's Julie it. Julie had her, her finger on the, on the comment, and you skipped over it. She's like, what, "What's seriously? what's up, man? What's yeah. up, guys? Yeah." <laughs> <laughs>